The Net of Indra. The metaphor of Indra's jeweled net asks us to envision a vast net that, at each juncture, there lies a jewel. Each jewel reflects all the other jewels in this cosmic matrix. Every jewel represents an individual life form, atom, cell, or unit of consciousness. Each jewel, in turn, is intrinsically and intimately connected to all the others. Thus, a change in one gem is reflected in all the others. Hundreds of thousands of people have died unnecessary deaths. The question is why? Most of what I treat in my office is chronic disease. Our bodies are ill-prepared for and a lot of disease results. Probably about half of the disease you see in the hospital is due to living in an environment we're not prepared for. But perhaps the most startling part is that many of these chronic diseases could have been prevented. Chronic disease is all the ailments from heart disease to diabetes to depression that are just chipping away at our quality of life. rounds in a modern hospital with me in the medical ward sometime and just make a note of each patient as you go through which of these patients would actually be there if they lived in the natural environment compared with our modern environment. These chronic diseases seem to be moving ever further down in the age bracket to the point where I'm seeing more and more children with diabetes and heart disease, morbid obesity. Experts call it diabesity. Over the past decade, childhood cases of type 2 diabetes have increased tenfold because of rising rates of obesity. The immune systems in modern people, particularly in, in the developed rich countries, are trigger happy. They're doing crazy things, attacking our own tissues, like attacking the brain, so then you have multiple sclerosis. All of these are situations where the immune system is doing things it should not be doing. And in developing countries, it doesn't do these things. So something has changed in the rich developed countries, which is causing our immune systems to lose the control mechanisms that normally stop them from behaving irresponsibly. medical profession is now actually the third leading cause of death in the United States. People didn't understand why when we get antibiotics, it causes many problems. Not only that, but each cell in our body has mitochondria that have been before bacteria. So bacteria is the fabric of all the living system. So we did so many mistakes on our gut bacteria. As we have less and less infectious disease, we have more and more chronic disease. But even conditions like multiple sclerosis and depression are now thought to have some microbial involvement. And so it may be, as we've conquered infectious disease, some of the strategies like antibiotics have been either eliminating beneficial microbes or promoting the growth of harmful microbes that are contributing to these chronic diseases in ways that we're just beginning to understand. Most of it relates back to our lifestyle, so to the foods that we're eating, the highly processed foods with, you know, lots of sugar and very low nutrient, to the fact that we experience a huge amount of stress and that we're disconnected from our communities. We're starting to discover also to the fact that we're disconnected from the natural world. We're gradually killing ourselves off. People have to start realizing that we're all connected. I mean, including 
the creatures of the earth, including the plants, the aina, the land. At some point, uh, it'll come back and bite us if we don't start uh, changing our ways. Actually, it's starting to bite us already. I love to garden without gloves. My name is Dr. Daphne Miller, and I'm a family doctor and a nutrition explorer. And I feel like I wear gloves enough in my medical practice, and why should I have to wear them in my garden where everything is so wonderful and where they're the kind of microbes that I want to be connected to, so. Agroecology is the science that provides the basic ecological principles for how to study, design, and manage agrosystems that are both productive and natural resource conserving, and that are culturally sensitive, socially just, and economically viable. We can get behind that, right? Agroecology goes beyond a one-dimensional view of agrosystems. The heart of the agroecology strategy is the idea that an agroecosystem should mimic the functioning of local ecosystems. But the word health has not come up once yet. The key agroecological strategy in designing a sustainable agriculture is to reincorporate diversity into the agricultural fields and surrounding landscapes. How about human health? No, no, no health here. Okay. I'm pleased and, uh, to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Daphne Miller. She will be talking about diverse farming system, diverse diets. She's a family physician, a writer, and associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. I wanted also to add this sentence, which I like myself. Ms. Muller approaches medicine with the idea that opportunities for health and healing are, are found not only in the medical system, but in such unexpected places such as home kitchens, school gardens, community organization, spiritual centers, farmers, and nature trails. Thank you. We're hitting a wall, and we know that pills and surgeries are not making a dent in the rates of diabetes and heart disease that we're seeing. The most important thing to understand is that there is no one answer. Health is something that needs to be engaged with every day throughout the day in dozens of little choices that we make. The bad news is that it's complicated. My 40th birthday, I had a really bad uh, headache. Ultimately, it was determined that I had a disorder called neurosarcoidosis. They started treating me with uh, prednisone, with steroids. I tried to watch TV. TV was too slow. So I finally had to bring in my laptop. And that was the only thing that was you know, fast enough that I could deal with, because these drugs just had my brain going. 106,000 Americans are killed every year for side effects of prescription drugs. This is not drug errors. This is not uh, illicit drugs. And this is actually just confined to drugs given in hospitals. And the steroids were um, great and that the symptoms that I was having went away. And within maybe two weeks of going on these massive doses of steroids, my appetite was back. and. I had gained somewhere in the neighborhood 30 or 40 pounds in two weeks because I was eating like a teenage boy. What I didn't know at that time was that prednisone can, can lead to diabetes. So I began a course of medication for diabetes. We tend to medicalize health. We tend to really think of it within the purview of what we can do that's either a drug or a surgery <laughs> or some kind of chemical intervention to make us feel better. And in fact, we know that there's many, many other things out there that have everything to do with creating this balance. I mean, I'm really thankful that Western medicine saved his life because, you know, definitely it was going down hill fast. But at the same time, you know, the prednisone has got such terrible side effects that it's 
-hmm. It's just one of those things that, oh. It's like those old 40s and 50s movies where somebody saves your life and now they own you. This is where I pay you off. The hubris of thinking that we could simplify this complex system, put it all on a pill. We should be surprised if that ever worked. If a drug company came up with a pill that had the benefits of broccoli, I mean, they'd be making billions of dollars because it's just so clear cut. So our reductionist approach is doing very little in the face of this epidemic of chronic disease. Reductionism means taking a system and reducing it into its component parts as if um, the whole is just the sum of its parts. And we can take any single part out, you know, get the same, same effect as the whole. Such processes do not really occur in nature. Uh, one of the first ones was Descartes, which basically said you cannot study nature in its complexity, you have to study in its parts. And that's when the transdisciplinary nature of knowledge was divided into commodities or disciplines. The second influence was Darwin. Darwin Although he came up with the theory of evolution, he emphasized the survival of the fittest, which means competition. The, com the ones that are successful competitors make it. When it, it turns out that in nature, there's much more complementarity and collaboration and cooperation than competition. The traditional linear model, the pharmaceutical company model is, let's identify one probiotic that we put into this extremely complicated system which is equally complicated to our brain and that will cure disease. In the modern systems view, not the right way of looking at it. We see now that we don't live in a linear world, that A causes B causes C. What in fact we live in is a complex network. It's a complex system where everything is related to everything else. It's that kind of thinking, the science of complex systems or adaptive complex systems that, 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 that determine our future. What you need for a complex problem is a complex solution. One of the things that we've done is, uh, that was really important to us was uh, we started a garden when we got the house. That was one of the first things that we did and started growing our own food. It's kind of something that's become more integrated into our lives. It tends to drive a lot of things. Like we look at some of the food in the grocery store now and just go, I don't want that. Yeah, I want, I want tomatoes from my garden. I started really thinking about how I eat and, and what I eat and started to, to refine that. I grew up outside of Buffalo, and a friend of mine who grew up there, too, she calls it the land of meat. <laughs> a meal is meat with other things around it. To have a salad as a meal would be like having a side dish as a meal. It was harder to avoid it than it was to, uh, to just take it in. You grow up, you don't question it, but when you get to, I don't know, our age, and meat has some bad effects on your body. <laughs> my life then was really very much about my work and eating uh, as conveniently as possible. Food is emotional. It's, uh, it's part of, I don't know, who you are. That was the Ronnie then. Gotten down to where I'm about, average around 210 or so, and that keeps me healthy. Uh, my blood sugar level has been in the normal range now for actually probably a couple of years. Does that mean that you don't have diabetes anymore? I no longer have diabetes. Because so. you're not taking any medication for your diabetes. No. And before I was taking uh, daily medication, well, twice daily medication for my diabetes. What we were taught in medical school is that you can't reverse diabetes. That was really what we were taught, that it was kind of like a runaway train. And once it was, you know, the brakes were off, it just, it was never coming back to the station. And um, you really have disproved that. And I just find it amazing. Um, and you're not alone, but it's something that's very inspirational for other people to know that that can happen. My life has, especially in the last 10 years or so, has been about trying to establish routines where I could be comfortable and focus on what's really important to me. If the revolution continues the way it's gone the last five years, 
I think we will have to see some dramatic changes that dietary interventions may have a much bigger influence, I think, in, in medical care, both prevention of diseases, but also treatment of various disorders. Yeah, I kind of think of it too as that's money that I don't have to spend going to the uh, hospital or something else later. So it's part of my insurance plan. <laughs> We had an epidemic of diabetes, epidemic of uh, nutrition-related problems. And uh, I show up at Harvard, and there's only one MD in my uh, nutrition program, and that was me. And I was absolutely shocked. I had uh, a couple of people lower their cholesterol over 50 points in 10 days. If you can lower your cholesterol 50 points in 10 days, why would you want to take a statin drug that's known to cause liver damage, muscle damage, memory loss, and and now there, uh, now there are lawsuits about Lipitor causing diabetes. Why would you want to take that stuff if you can do it naturally? And by the way, the side effects of doing it like that is, well, your blood sugar gets better, your, your blood pressure gets better, and you might lose weight if you were, well, you will lose weight if you're overweight. Here in the United States, the number one killer is diet. So what we eat determines our lifespan, our health span, in terms of both disability and uh, mortality. I went from close to 300 pounds with a 42-inch waist down to about 190 with a 34-inch waist. Blood pressure was probably one of the biggest things that changed. I was diagnosed uh, pre-diabetic because both my blood pressure numbers were completely off the charts, and that almost changed immediately. It also changed my palate. A lot of the food that's actually available right now in our supermarkets or in our restaurants didn't taste good. I, I had to go out and find or grow the type of food that, that my body wanted, wanted, to, wanted to eat. In less than, I would even say nine months, completely changed how I look, how I felt. You know, people who I've seen my, old, my whole life did, didn't recognize me. And I <laughs> was often accused of being on drugs because the amount of weight that, that I dropped and, and my, my body just completely changed. The native people uh, have just about the worst health in the nation. If you look at mortality statistics, we were uh, unfortunately uh, double the rate of heart disease, double the rate of cancer, double the rate of stroke. Uh, this is in terms of mortality for pure Hawaiians, five times the rate for diabetes. So I actually went back to the Bishop Museum and started collecting photographs of Hawaiians in the old days, uh, in including drawings from Captain Cook's artists in, back in 1778. And you saw slim Hawaiians. Number one, there was no sugar. I mean, they didn't have it back in 17. 78, I mean, that was a Western invention. Their main staple was uh, taro and poi, which is made from taro, and sweet potatoes and yams and a little bit of breadfruit. The change in the diet, lifestyle, eating processed food and so much meat and so much fat uh, has contributed to the obesity epidemic here. And of course, all the diseases that come along with it. I remember when I was a kid, you could count the number of fast food places on one hand on the whole island. Now, there's fast food places on every corner. We're faced with a society that's already been brainwashed to eat meat three times a day, dairy three times a day, taught that lean meat and chicken is health food, which it is not. We need to educate people. The healthiest way is, the, is nature's way. After all, for thousands of years, we've been eating whole grains and vegetables and beans and animals were not fattened up like they are today uh, or chemicalized. Basically, uh, we're gradually poisoning ourselves. All you have to do is look at the obesity maps in the U.S. It's getting worse and worse and worse. We're just totally being screwed over. That You've got this junk food industry that's spending billions of dollars to get the young kids to eat their shit. By the time these poor kids are 
13, 14 years old, they got all kinds of diseases. They got asthma, they got attention deficit, they got, they got so much going on that it's just out of control. And it's, it's really, really, really sad. These remarkable studies in which uh, the progression of cancer was reversed with the whole food plant-based diet, progression of heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes reversed in cases even cure. It's the complexity in the diet, how those foods come together, and how those foods interact with the soil that really offers us the real medicine. Is there anybody who's in the health field in this room? Anybody working in health at all? Wow, okay, I really am alone. <laughs> how, how many farmers do we have here today? Oh, a couple of farmers, wonderful. Well. To the farmers in the room, I look at you and me as one and the same. We're doing the exact same work. We're here to keep people healthy and heal our communities. And hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll all agree with me that that is the case. All right, we've got the kitchen waste compost in here. And down inside there, we have worms. And so the worms are eating up the kitchen compost. And we're getting a little bit of rain now. If it was a drought time, we'd water it. And every day we collect, we collected it this morning already, but we get this incredible worm juice. And we use it for watering our nursery and, and other plants that are, that are in need of help. As far as obtaining anything in a store, nothing comes close to how wonderful this works at putting nutrients into your plants. Look yeah, these coconuts, man. They're only, they're only four years old and I'm eating coconuts off of them. Yeah, this is uh, quite the sight, is to have a coconut tree where you gotta get down on your knees to harvest. Right there, there were 16 coconuts. Nice view, see, we get to watch the whales every winter. Wow. The whales park out here, it's all winter long, we get to watch the whales bre breaching out here, it's really beautiful. They call me Ginger John, that's what everybody knows me by on the island. <laughs> Not only are they producing the food that keeps us healthy, but they're protecting the land and the soil, which is absolutely critical to our own health. Gaffney? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good to meet you too. Aloha. This is your property, huh? This, uh... It's all of ours. Well, so it's mine too. That's yours too. Okay. We're standing okay. here. Life brought you here. <laughs> Enjoy. You look fantastic. So obviously Six, it's eight years old and I work circles around these 20 year olds. I was the vanguard of the hippie movement and somehow I got the message to come to Hawaii. So I got here in 1967. Ended up living on this beach, McKenna Beach on Maui for two years with no clothes and no money, no blanket, nothing. Getting disconnected, so to speak, connected me. I was laying on the beach and thinking, you know, you can die. You better go into town so they can do something for your body. I was sitting about ready to fall over and this old Hawaiian lady came up to me and saw that I was really ill and just embraced me and asked me what was wrong. And I told her I was bleeding from my lungs. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And she said, well, when the Hawaiians had lung diseases, they ate noni. And she took me to a noni tree because noni used to grow everywhere. And I started eating nonis and I haven't stopped. I've been eating nonis for 50 years, man. I'm way into eating noni. I eat it every morning. That's amazing. So you were you were near death. It sounds I've like. been near death many many times. I've had just about every disease you can think of, and I just lay down on the ground and go through it. I don't go to doctors. I'm sure John told you all about taro and how beautiful it is. This is the only hypoallergenic food in the world. You can give this to a baby, a day old. If they have a milk allergy to their own mother's milk. Give it to a baby. It'll sustain them. That's the stuff. My name is Connor Garrett. I'm from Naples, Florida. I'm wolfing here on Ginger John's farm. I initially came here with the intention to do so and then move on, go back to what I was doing. But now I'm, I've become quite uh, enveloped in this lifestyle and I don't really plan on going back anytime soon. John's somebody who will definitely blow your mind in a lot of ways. Tool's called a hodad. My favorite tool. You know, he does intensive farming. It's not like gardening. It's, it's not anything in a hoop house where you're spraying chemicals and you get to prance around with the flowers, you gotta rip things out of the ground and beat the dirt off of them. Yeah, <laughs> 
You can make it. I'm glad you can make it. This is all yours? This amazing estate here? Sort of. Sort of. Well, the, ba the bank owns some of it. <laughs> and my children own some of it. But this is a family farm. Can we have a tour first? You can do okay. anything you want to do. Yeah, let's have a tour and then I, I sit pity down the, the I pity the man that says no to you. And how many acres do you have? We've, we've got about 100 acres of soybeans. And we just finished this field Monday. That was the one we planted after wheat that we dried. Right. And this was the one we just planted. And the one that we're finished working on right now is uh, I don't know, what we call early beans. They were planted in, um, in May. Do you buy seeds from Monsanto, by the way? Monsanto Technology Card. My goodness. So the genetic modification allowed us to use some simple applications of a herbicide, Roundup primarily. It killed everything but the corn. We kill everything but the soybeans. Our cost went down. It was easier to farm. It was easier to maintain. We used to have like a smorgasbord of chemicals we were trying to pick out what to use. So you'd have to make a cocktail mixture of what to apply to kill the weeds that were choking the crop. Roundup took it all. You can imagine that anything that is engineered to kill off bacteria in the soil is going to do the same thing in our gut. And pesticides and herbicides do exactly that. They work the same way as antibiotics work. They, they, they kill living things. So we're standing at the side of the Century Experiment, which is a 100-year research experiment looking at the sustainability of different agricultural systems. And so there's this contrast between managing soil sort of like cookbook style, following a menu. And you put in this and that at this time, then you spray this. So it's pretty much a, you know, a codified approach that you might get from an extension, as opposed to other farmers who actually talk about farming the soil. And they talk about having a relationship with the soil they talk about doing as much for the soil as they're doing for their crops. They may even put more emphasis on the soil because they feel like if they take care of the soil, then the crops are going to do fine. An organic farmer grows soil. It's light. Um, a chemical farmer grows crops. So how do you put nutrients back in? So we will buy uh, usually commercial fertilizers. It's got an earthworm in it. Hey, buddy. Yo, you're on camera. <laughs> That's good. So if my crops don't do well, it's not because of what I'm putting in, it's because of the soil. We don't really know where it's sourced. Right. Does that ever worry you? That you're putting all this stuff on your field from some foreign place? No, it doesn't. Place? When you're locked into a system that seems to be working, it's really hard to make the change. The whole agribusiness system has separated this whole, and I think that's part of what the local food movement and a lot of what's going on is how do we make that connectivity to it and I don't know how individually to bridge that gap. I don't know how to do it. I don't, I don't know my consumer. I have no connection whatsoever. My farming style is to grow the food crops that have sustained civilization. When I sit down to eat, 90% of what I eat comes from this farm. I really feel like I'm cheating. So where, where do you get your food? I go to the Kroger stores. Really? Yeah. You go and shop in a grocery store for food? Sure, every, every farmer does. I know very few who actually consume the food on their own farm. The average food that we eat travels about 1,500 miles. And a city like Rome, for example, has to import 5,000 tons of food per day. Can you imagine the fragility of a system like that? The consequences of a system like that that it has on transportation, energy, and greenhouse gases. I mean, things have to change. And that's local agriculture. And much of that local agriculture is founded in traditional agriculture. To feed a, a person in the developed world with conventional agriculture, we need about 12 barrels of oil per year, per person. If we think about the moment in which the world produced its peak of oil, that was about five barrels per person 
per year. There is not enough oil in the world to sustain food production under the conventional model. It works because it only works in a small part of the world. Most farmers don't raise food. We don't know much about food. We know about the product. I think some sadness in your eyes when I say that, but I think it's a legitimate statement is that we just don't have a way to connect with that aspect. Organic farming receives, uh, in a country like the Netherlands, about 10% of the funding uh, for, uh, for agricultural research. Now, the Netherlands invests then in organic farming something like $4 million per year. A company like Monsanto invests $900 million per year in research. And most of the governments in the world invest most of the money in conventional farming. When I harvest the wheat, I can put it under loan with USDA. I can at least get three quarters of its market value the day I harvest it. So there's lots of incentives for me to stay inside of that safety net. What you're telling me is that the government is a lot more reliable customer for you. On the basic commodities that we raise in this country, the feed grains, the wheat, the corn, the government through farm bills has provided a way to, to at least protect you and have a marketing system. Although the gap in yields between organic and conventional is only 20%, the gap in investments in research is 100%. And yet, without research, without funding, organic farming is pushing and coming closer to conventional farming. So the results, the progress made per dollar invested in research is huge. It's a way of life. You live like a peasant, you work like a slave, but you eat better than any king ever ate. And the important part about that is that is your health insurance. I don't have health insurance. I don't have social security. I have this. There's another cemetery on the farm over there on the hillside, and there's some Hintons buried over there. But this is sort of the, the plot. I figure that's my spot about there at some point. I'm curious to hear what happens with you in the next couple years, Hoppy, because I, I do well, believe well, maybe you, you will. Hopefully, little... I'll, hopefully you're going to talk to my daughter, and you're going to she's going to have a whole new approach on this thing, OK? This, this is the generational shift. This is going to change. That statement about not growing food, that farmers don't grow food, was unbelievable to me. That was amazing. I mean, I just wrote a whole book about farmers being healers and that they had the health of their community as this sort of primary uh, concern. And I think that might be the case for a small subset of farmers, but from what Hoppy was saying, that certainly isn't the case for the majority of farmers. I see this as the single largest health issue that is facing our country. Can growing food or growing products be something that is net positive for us? Can it be healing? Last Sunday, we told you about a WHO report that listed several chemicals as potentially cancer-causing, including glyphosate, found in the popular weed killer Roundup. Now, in an interview for an upcoming French documentary, a Canadian scientist has been caught in an Aaron Brockovich-like moment when he's asked to defend that chemical against links to cancer rates in Argentina. Take a look. I do not believe glyphosate in Argentina is causing increases in cancer. You can drink a whole quart of it and it won't hurt you. It's, yeah, uh, it, you want to drink some? We have some here. I'd be happy to, actually. But you, not, not really, but... Not really? I know it wouldn't hurt I mean, me. If, if, if you say so, I have some glyphosate. No, no, I'm not stupid. Ah, okay, so you... you, you no, but I know... So that, it's dangerous, I right? Know, I, no, people try to commit suicide no, with no, it and no, fail no, fairly regularly. Tell the truth. It's, it's not dangerous, dangerous to humans. No, it's no. not. So you're ready to drink one glass of no, glyphosate? No, I'm not an idiot. Even though this may look disgusting to most people because this is really um, kind of dirty looking, I know that the microorganism living in here is, in, is the most beneficial one on Earth. And so I'm not afraid to take a big drink of it and um, super probiotic. Got a little bite to it too. And this is essentially the food for the microorganisms when I put them out there. And this one's much better. For two years, I was trying to grow taro in these fields. And I've been growing taro for 
about 40 years and I never had a problem, yet I couldn't get a crop to really grow. I was getting really discouraged and then I heard about um, Master Cho and Korean Natural Farming. The Korean Water is made of the water, so the water is not going to give the water, it's not going to give the water, it's not going to give the water, it's going to give the water. It's going to give the water to the water. 자립력을 키울 수 있도록 뒷받침을 해주는 것이지. 그러니까 우리가 그런 거가 그 초보자라도 누구든지 할수 있는 것은 시키는 대로 하면 돼요. It's kind of designed for peasants like myself. And all these different things, when combined in the right proportions, make the microorganisms thrive and brings the earth back to life. The microorganisms are inside of us. They're on our skin. They're in our lungs. They are really what connect us to the world around us. Nothing was growing, there wasn't an earthworm here. And he had IMOs to reintroduce the, that fungal um, network into his soil here. And the results have spoken for themselves. Indigenous microorganisms are basically probiotics for agriculture. IMOs are made by farmers using the materials from that land and then fermenting it and putting it back into the land where it can help the plants and the fungi and all the uh, uh, soil and everything that's there thrive. Nice. If you have totally white mold like this, it's the, the excellent IMO1 that we cultivated. From, from this stage, you would Collect all this into a jar and add, add equal amount of uh, sugar to the rice, and so that way we'll move it to IMO two. 자연 농업은 있는 그대로에서 나가는 거예요. 거기다 자기의 욕심을 가미한다든지 지식을 가미하는 게 아니라 있는 그대로에서 그걸 갖다 우리는 영위 철학이라고 얘기를 해요. 영위 철학적으로 삶으로 관찰해야 되거든요. We planted the red lettuces. I was spraying them with the Korean natural farming and then I guess when I wasn't paying attention, I forgot the one at the end. Then I came back and the other red lettuces are four times the size of the other red lettuce and they were all planted on the same day except for the front half of the row um, received Korean natural farming um, nutrients. Four inches deep that this tester can get into the ground. So this is a conventional practice. So this is six inches. I have about eight inches deep in the organic plot. So I have scattered the IMO for uh, last season before we planted tomato in here. So you can see that I get to a deeper level in the soil compaction. And now we can see how deep it gets. So this is 12 inches. I have it about 14 inches. So from four inches in the conventional practice, eight inches in the organic, now we have 14 inches in the Korean nature farming. When you have a commercial plant, you have a very small root system because they're drug dependent. So the roots don't have to travel. There's nothing for them to go out there for. It's dead, it's a dead zone. And they're just living on these chemicals that have been fed them. If you're farming uh, with, with microorganisms, you're doing a biological farming and you have a good population of microbes in the soil, the root systems will go very far out, hundreds of feet. Korean natural farming, what farmers are doing is recognizing that the microbes that are there on that farm and in that soil are really critical to the life cycle of the farm and to the health of the plants and to the health of the people who eat <laughs> those plants. I have a degree in computer science and um, decided to learn how to farm. Of all the techniques you can pick, Korean natural farming is like right on with the kids because every single thing we use is edible. Um, and so with the kids, I don't have to worry about them getting you know, poison on them and eating it or like getting in dangerous situations. They just, everything they can eat, if they spill it, it's not a problem, you know? It just goes into the ground and makes things better. Now right here, you're probably looking at six billion microorganisms in this little chunk here. What Ginger John is practicing is basically complexity medicine, you know, or complexity farming. Can you see that white on your yeah. film? That, that's the microorganisms going to work here. The ones with the microorganisms were um, flourishing. They were 
twice as large, very green. The cups were full of roots. So right then we knew, wow, what is this magic? And here's an IMO4 pile here. The first time that I started applying my IMO4 to the land and I'm dumping it out, I had this incredible feeling of sovereignty that I was freeing myself from the need of spending harder money on anything that was being shipped over across the ocean from the mainland. A plant will put out a stress signal that it's lacking some kind of nutrient. It could be like boron or magnesium or calcium. The fungus that are attached to the roots of the plant will sense that imbalance. It can actually send a signal to an area that's rich and it will bring that to the plant. Some of them live in the rhizosphere, in the root of plants. Root of plants is extremely complex environment because there are many, many organisms living there. Some of them cooperate, some of them compete. So they have to develop, in order to survive, extremely sophisticated social intelligence. Very much like human in social intelligence, just more advanced. So I came with an idea, what are the features that characterize social intelligence? And then I found that our own bacteria, the bacteria that I discovered, fall in the three standard deviation above the average. So they are like Einstein. They have special circuits to process the information and even engage in decision-making. Looking at the desert, these social bacteria play enormous role on the integrity of Earth because all these bushes that you see here are connected underneath. So all these things that you see around us, it's one big network. It's super far out. It's almost so, like, I'm way too scientific. At first I was like, no, that's some heavy stuff. <laughs> no, it's real. It happens, and it's part of healthy soil, and you'll never see it in conventional agriculture. One of the things I've been studying is soil biology with a 400 power microscope, and with that, I'm able to see the beneficial fungus and bacteria and very quickly, quantitatively decide if I'm doing it right or not. All throughout this sample of the beneficial microorganisms, I'm finding nice fungus and I'm finding much more biodiversity. They're the ones who are harvesting nutrients from the soil and passing them on to the roots of the plants, we're then passing them on to us. Scientists have now discovered important clues about the role of so-called good bacteria. A new study in the journal Nature finds that people without certain microbes are more likely to be obese and to have diabetes or other serious health problems. The fascinating thing about the human microbiome is that we now realize there is a entire organ inside of us that until about five or 10 years ago, nobody even thought about. And all the medical theories about health and disease have been made without that organ. It's a mass of cells that weighs about the same as your brain, but it has more genes, uh, more cells, arguably more connections and more complexity. And it plays some physiologically well-defined roles. Uh, we're just beginning to understand what all those roles are. And it's not an, an insubstantial organ because it has composed of 100 trillion cells. These are 10 times more cells than our entire repertoire of human cells. There's so much excitement about it because it turns out that most of our genes are not human genes, but microbial genes. There's something going on inside of us that is very exciting, mysterious, and people are now shifting their attitude towards understanding this, implicating the microbiome in virtually every function of the body. They're doing all kinds of things we had no idea with, that they were involved with until very recently. Everything from affecting how we process our diet to how we, uh, how we respond to different drugs, even to things like how we resist different kinds of diseases. One of the more intriguing things about the microbiome is its possible role in um, human obesity. Millions of microbes that live in the guts of slim people could be turned into potential fat fighters to help the nation's obesity epidemic, according to a new study. They've taken stool material from lean and obese twins, so they're twin humans, and if you take the stool from the obese twin and give it to a mouse, that mouse will become fat. And if you take the stool from a lean twin and give it to a different mouse, that mouse stays thin. What's really important about that is that the two mice, they eat the same, they exercise the same. So the only factor that was different was the microbiome that they received. They're not just sitting there as inactive bystanders. They produce many chemicals that are very similar to the neurotransmitters that our brain uses. They talk to our immune cells, they talk to various cells within our gut. The reason that it's truly caught the imagination of people is this idea that we are host 
to all these creatures. And those internal bacteria we're discovering are maybe as important as our own DNA in our own cells when it comes to determining our mood, how we process food, how our immune system works. As a kid, I was a huge germaphobe. One of the things that we've learned is, you know, they're not, most of them aren't germs, most of them aren't bad. So if you eat a little dirt, it's not gonna hurt. So we're, you know, introducing diversity to ourselves and that diversity, especially as children, is so important for helping our immune system develop properly. So now I'm not so worried about touching door handles or getting my hands dirty because I know that I'm just increasing the diversity of my microbes. That's pretty good for my health. Having a dog is one of the best evidence-based things that you can do uh, in terms of reducing the rates of, uh, of allergies later on. They're as much our inheritance as the genes in our chromosomes are. And yet much of the way we live nowadays, we seem to be trying to stop transmission of mother's microbes to the baby. We need to transmit the microbiota to the baby. Everyone assumes that breast milk is sterile, but not only is it not sterile, there is a biological mechanism to ensure that it is not. And there are organisms being picked up from the guts, transported in the blood, and put into breast milk. One has to guess that, that those are organisms that is quite difficult to get from the maternal gut into the baby's gut in other ways. And mother's milk contains a succession of interesting polysaccharides produced at different stages during lactation, which act as growth factors for the organisms that need to be developing in the baby's gut at each stage after, after, after birth. But we do seem to be trying to block this essential transmission of the microbiota to the next generation. You come out the regular way, as you pass through the birth canal, you're coated with a particular set of microbes from your mother, whereas if you're delivered by C-section instead, you miss out on that inoculation, and essentially what you pick up is, is skin microbes from other people, or possibly, uh, possibly from dust floating around in the air. All of these things are limiting the transmission of the microbiota, which is part of the family's heritage, part of the genetics of the family. The, the reason why this is important is if you're delivered by C-section, uh, you have higher rates of a whole lot of diseases uh, with, with immune complications, including uh, asthma, allergies, atopic disease, even obesity. They really determine who we are. The bushes you see around is a colony of many microorganisms. We are also a colony of many microorganisms. The art was part of the science, and the science is part of the art. The coloring started not really just to make art, but for us to capture different features in different motifs in the pattern. Because it seems like many secrets are hidden there. So each time we do new experiments, we find new patterns, and I keep like a child. Wow! complexity of the pattern reflects the fact that you have distribution of tasks. You have these dots on the colony that you see. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bacteria that connect together. They hold hands and they dance together. They circle around and they pave the way to the colony to move on hard surfaces. When you have a complex pattern, when the environment changes and in the soil the environment changes, they can change the shape, change the mix, makeup of the colony and adapt to the new conditions. This is mother nature, is the microorganisms in the soil, and that's what make all of the globe one big organism. Restoring this and rejuvenating back to growing your own beneficial microorganisms and um, re-inoculating them into the environment is really the only way to turn the page and to heal our forests, to heal our ocean um, and the systems that keep us alive. On an ordinary day out in a, out, out, out walking in the park or something, there might be maybe 100,000 organisms per cubic meter of air. But if you're out there with your brush cutter on, on, on a summer's day, or if you're in a cow shed, you're up to hundreds of millions. And so you're taking an enormous number of organisms from the natural environment. Our bodies are not islands. We are very, very porous creatures who are constantly exchanging information and exchanging DNA with the environment around us. And as we go on this adventure to discover what makes us healthy and what keeps us in balance, that has to be part of the equation. It's sort of these microscopic 
influences that have a huge amount to do with our well-being. So there, we're beginning to have real evidence, real hard evidence, that exposure to the green environment is doing things to our immune systems, which is relevant to how our immune systems function, and which is therefore relevant to human health. The problem is we don't live in either a natural or an urban environment anymore. We live indoors. To think that we have evolved with a contact with nature for tens of millennia, and to think that moving ourselves to a profoundly artificial environment have no consequences, is, I think you'd be willfully naive to believe that. As of 2008, more people live in cities than in the countryside all around the world. That's the first time in human history. It raises big questions about the future of our cities. It raises huge questions about the future of the human race. That means one of two things. Either the human species will continue to lose whatever connection to nature it still has, or it means the beginning of a new kind of city. If you're interested in trees and how they benefit people, then ultimately you realize the, the, the trees that give the, the greatest benefit are in cities. They're near the people. The paradox of an urban society, we get most of our interaction with the natural environment in an urban environment. The Atlantic uh, did an interesting uh, piece about the, this research, and they had a somewhat provocative uh, title. Um, it's when trees die, people die. Whether the trees were the nicest trees in urban areas, they're also the people who tend to be whiter, wealthier, better educated, they're more privileged. They're gonna people who are gonna tend to have better health outcomes anyway. And trying to disentangle that relationship can be really, it can be tricky. The cold weather, nothing compared to what the emerald ash borer can do. This tiny bug is eating its way through trees and destroying landscapes all across Western New York. Let's see what happens when the emerald ash borer spreads out from Detroit and see if there are health consequences. I looked at two causes of death, cardiovascular disease and then lower a respiratory disease. We did see increased levels of, uh, of these two types of diseases um, in counties that were infested with emerald ash borer. There was a bigger impact in wealthier counties. If trees are good for you, and we know that those wealthier counties are going to have more of them, then killing those trees should be have a bigger health impact, and that is indeed what we saw. People who are at the bottom end of the socioeconomic scale and are not close to green space are about twice as likely to die in that five-year period as the people at the top of the socioeconomic scale. As they get closer to green space, so this difference between the top and the bottom of the socioeconomic scale starts to disappear. Most people who talk in the environmental movement talk about, you know, the morality of it. Do we hit the very stern? And we have to protect nature because it's the right thing to do. Well, I'm an economist. I, I study selfishness. And what I understand is that, you know, scolding people to do things ain't very effective. The type of stuff I do and other people is showing that looking after the natural environment is profoundly self-interested. And when you appeal to people's self-interest, <laughs> then that's a different matter. Then, you know, if, if you can show people this is in really, really in your best interest to do that, then I think we are going to see some change. Nature deficit disorder is not a known medical diagnosis. Basically what it is is a metaphor to describe the harm that comes to the human species when it doesn't have much connection to the natural world. And the way to show that is not by saying this kid has nature deficit disorder and this kid exhibits these symptoms. You could do that, but what I would rather do is look at all this positive research that's come out and then ask if that's connected to the natural world what happens when you take the natural world away shouldn't every kid and in fact i think every adult have a right to the benefits of being in the natural world really what it gets down to are these small choices about you know we plant a tree here we preserve a park here that's what's going to really make the day-to-day -day difference in people's lives i believe i was in a uh, hotel room one day in San Francisco and I picked up one of those magazines that you wonder where they come from in the, the hotel rooms and I was flipping through it and I looked at the back page and there was this black and white photograph of a little boy on a beach. He's running along and his eyes are filled with life and the story next to this photograph said this little boy had a problem. He had the wiggles, he couldn't sit still, he was disruptive in class, the school finally kicked him out. The parents were upset of course but they'd been very observant. They'd noticed how a little bit of time in nature helped their little boy calm himself and focus. So for the next 10 years, they took their little boy all over the great Western wilderness areas. Uh, the kid turned out okay. The photograph was taken in 1906. And the little boy's name was Ansel Adams. 
So here's a question. What would have happened if they'd taken little Ansel and put him in a chair in front of a desk, in front of a computer, told him to sit there, take tests all day, canceled recess, which more and more schools are doing, canceled field trips, lengthened the school day, lengthened the school, and then given him Ritalin? Would we have the gifts of nature that Ansel gave us? Would we have the political support such as it is for the national parks without his photographs? How many little Ansels and Ancelettes are out there right now who could give us great gifts in the future if we give them the great gift of nature now? Kind of been slowly peeling back the story of what is ailing Hawaiians. Finally, this afternoon, we started to get at a glimmer of amazing hope for how to heal by seeing that these kids, by reconnecting to that land and really understanding how to grow things and how to nourish themselves and how to nourish them soil, their soil can make themselves healthy. Working with the kids has been so powerful because showing them that the earth is alive at a young age really will impact how they grow up. You know, are they gonna be going and buying Roundup or are they gonna be going out to their soil and, and realizing it's alive and really feeling that heart space connection to caring for the land. The kids here, they need economic opportunity. And through this agricultural practices where it's affordable to do, where it's environmentally sound, um, I, I believe it'll give everyone in this area a great opportunity to have a great life and to provide for their family and to be happy every day. Until you start doing this natural farming and realizing that the earth is alive, it changes your whole perspective. It has just made me so much more conscientious in every part of my life, brought so much more respect to the whole systems that are naturally there, providing such abundance already. So I went to the Marque region. It's like a fantasy land for agroecologists. They've been farming in these little plots for hundreds of years, ever since uh, the Benedictines, who are, were like the original hippies, went there and uh, started to create these little farms it, it, with their monasteries. And the soil there is very healthy and it's very beautiful. Nine, Ninety-two! You're ninety-two years old! Oh, bravo! Bravo! Maria, nena, Panis et pastoris virinum et regina. come la morte e l'amore, e nasce come gli inferi e la gelosia. Le sue vampe sono vampe di fuoco, una fiamma del Signore. Questo è il tipico della vita monastica. Pregare all'alba, quando appena viene la luce, vedi la luce, ecco che viene fuori il nuovo canto, che è la luce del giorno, che ti senti in sintonia con questo respiro del creato che rinasce. Ecco, questo è un ritmo vitale per ciascuno di noi, ma è il ritmo che mi mette in sintonia con la natura che respira. La mentalità che è stata portata è soprattutto la cura al creato, diciamo così, la cura alle, alla terra dalla quale eh, abbiamo tutto. La salute... Ma quando è che la persona sta in salute? Quando la persona agisce, vive e si dimentica anche un po' di se stessa. It's also known for being the place in Europe that has the most centenarians, people who are over 100 years old. In un anno io ho festeggiato 5 centenari a fermo e la percentuale è molto alta rispetto ai 38.000 abitanti. Presumo che questo sia dovuto anche alla situazione di una regione che comunque ha sempre curato in modo particolare il benessere attraverso il cibo, direi anche il lavoro. Meno la prevenzione, perché la prevenzione è la prevenzione contro le malattie, ma è la promozione della salute e la ricerca del benessere. La differenza tra prevenzione e promozione è questa. 
La prevenzione previene la malattia, la promozione invece la mantiene, la esalta, la aumenta. E soprattutto perché è una regione dove si è molto curato i prodotti, prodotti dell'agricoltura. Vegliando anzi, questa sorella anziana che vigila, li custodisce con tanto amore. Sor Beatrice ci ha proprio eh, ci parla, io, ci parla, lei ci parla con, con, questo, con questo luogo, lei parla con la pianta, con, col pomodoro, con i fiori e, e si rende conto di come vogliono essere trattati, detto tra virgolette, perché non sono persone, sono però se deve dare più acqua, se deve aspettare, se deve togliere qualche germoglio in più, cioè proprio... Fagiolina! Oh, 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 oh. I'm so sorry, I don't want to hurt the bees! Eh, se non vuole rovinare la coltivazione. Oh, ha detto che sono finiti i fagiolini. Ah. Oh, I'm sorry, Italia. Dice, dice finiti i fagiolini. Oh, non ci sono, fagioli. non, non ve li può offrire. No, okay. Hello, I'm so honored. Questa signora è una dottoressa che viene dall'America. Allora? Eh. Andiamo un attimo che ci fa qualche domanda. Oh, ma è la domanda che mi ha mi fa a me. E eh, ma vediamo qualcosa rispondi, no? Eh, ma io non ci sento, te lo dico io. <ride> Va bene, Sor Beatrice suggerisce le risposte, dai. <ride> Andiamo, dai. Piano piano, dai. Except she's moving faster yes. than everybody else. Questo va coperto perché sennò si secca. Okay. Oh, okay, this is 96. how you live to be 96. <laughs> right here. Si vede che il suo lavoro però. Si vede. Si vede. No, no, no. Si arrampica sull'albero a raccogliere la frutta. She climbs those trees? Yes, no. yes. She climbs that tree to get fruit? Yes, for, for no. taking your fruit. Ma okay. come a raccogliere la frutta? Tu ce l'hai? No, non c'è, non c'è. No, non c'è, lo so che okay. non c'è. <laughs> Now he's finished the food. Oh, they're all done. All done. No, they're all done. They're all done. No more peach. Ci sono rimaste le mele. Okay, we don't have to worry about her till next year. Questa, dove va? Dove va questa? Tu sei venuta qui tanti anni fa a riprendere la terra dove stavi quando eri bambina, è vero? Eh, avevo cinque anni. Allora, questo io non l'avevo detto, Suor Beatrice aveva sempre la febbre, stava male, era stata anche in ospedale a Roma e non trovavano una medicina per curarla. Ti volevi lavorare, ma io andavo per fare una visita. Eh. Non, non ci credeva che potesse avere, pensava che le mandava a fare una visita al campo. Quando tu sei venuta a lavorare la terra sei stata bene? Sì. Che lei tutta la sua vita... L'ha vissuta nel monastero nella preghiera e dedicandosi a questo lavoro. E quindi lei conosce ogni centimetro di questo terreno, conosce tutto. Tanto sai quando cresce. Io caro quello che ne fai, che dopo vabbè, ci vede tutti lì. <laughs> what I want to talk to you right now is about what we have lost. When we move away from those little fields in the Marche region, what are the health things that we've lost? Because these are all parts of agroecology, crop diversity, perennials and native seeds, traditional technologies, soil vitality, community. But what they really are is health. Io sono stato operato a tumore al pancreas, quindi tutti i medici mi dicono che cosa fai ancora qui perché dovevo essere in paradiso. You had a tumor in your pancreas? Yes. How long ago was that? Uh, nove anni. Nine, nine you years. You had a pancreatic tumor nine years ago? Pancreas, stomaco, fegato, cistifelia, duodeno, tutto mangiato. Sono qui ancora a dire questo. Grazie. Are they studying you? Are they from the scientific standpoint? <laughs> you are you are you are a miracle. Ma perché sono qui perché la grazia di Dio mi tiene qua. E poi per quella voglia, per quella gioia che ho di vivere. Non solo il cibo, non solo le cose, ma il nostro vivere è legato alla natura, ai cicli della natura. 
tutto quello che vivo, che sento, che provo, è, è, è per me, per la mia salute fisica, spirituale e morale. E mi diceva che se non si può, Can you give us a rundown of this? <laughs> Just give me one sec, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Padre Giovanni just shared stuff that was um, incredibly personal to him and that I didn't get the sense that he talks about it all the time. And uh, it affected me very deeply. He just got so much at the crux of what I'm trying to understand about those connections between our bodies and the earth. And he's just living this every day for him. It, it, it's his, it's um, his awareness, it's, it's his existence. And that story about him getting pancreatic cancer nine years ago, I mean, the life expectancy from what sounds like he had metastatic pancreatic cancer he had in his gut and everything is, three to six months and uh, it's really amazing he said he did all the medical treatments but he, there was this other side of what he did which possibly was the reason that he's still with us nine years ago nine years later people talk about healing the earth the earth heals us. Look around us and see the beauty. I mean, every sunrise and every sunset and every rain shower and every breeze and every cloud is so magnificent. I mean, what, what, what more beauty could there be? Even when we're living in a city on the 30th floor of a concrete high rise, we have to start to think of ourselves as part of an agroecological cycle. Only with that mentality are we going to actually leave something for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. So increasingly, instead of saying sustainable, I say nature rich. What does a nature rich city look like? A nature rich future, a nature rich yard filled with native species that bring back butterfly migration routes and bird migration routes. What does that future look like? When you begin to use terminology like a nature-rich city, people can see that in their mind's eye. And I can tell you, particularly young people resonate to that. They want to go there. They want to create that. We humans are so arrogant that we think the hypotheses that we come up with actually have anything to do with the complexity of the world around us. So ai in Hawaiian means to eat, means food, means reproduction and then na is in reference to the land so it's the land that feeds us. you are the servant to the land so that land doesn't only mean land it also means the ocean right everything in nature you are the servant to nature in order to live there's a movement that is sometimes called the new agrarians these are often young people who are dedicated to organic farming near a city or in a city. They're changing their neighborhoods. They're really uh, dedicated to uh, creating a, a different kind of food distribution. The attitude that we're now developing is a much more humble and modest attitude where we essentially say, we really don't understand nature, but we'll, we will listen to it in an unbiased way and we'll let the wisdom of and the intelligence of nature tell us how it's working and, and how it's operating. So we're really starting to think about how all these parts interconnect, not just to keep the land healthy and not just to keep the air healthy, but also to keep us healthy. The big challenge of life in general is trying to find balance, and once you find it, trying to maintain balance. It's not a goal that you achieve and then that's it. The balance is always going to shift again, and then you'll have to regain the balance. It's something that's constantly adapting, constantly moving, with thousands of different variables. And that, in fact, is balance. Almost everything is organized in interconnected systems, so simplest systems to the most complex ones. There's a, a natural law that when systems organize, they will obey one, just like the law of gravity. You could say there's a high intelligence that used to design to create the universe by a very beautiful, simple design that is scalable, that can be used in tiny little networks of insects, so ants talking to each other. There's two ways of explaining it, as an engineer or as a spiritual person. And I think at the moment they're both equally valid.
Awareness of interconnectedness is increasing in leaps and bounds as the new age of globalization accelerates. Our civilization has evolved, emphasizing the separation into parts for too long. On this realization of unbroken wholeness, our future may depend.